animator versus the machine. Begin. All right, thanks for joining me today. I am super excited and kind of nervous as this has been in the wild making for a while now. Uh, today I'll be talking to, not to one guest, but three, maybe two, depending on how things go. Uh, each of these guests represent a different studio in Ottawa who have been making cartoons for over 30 years. If you've watched anything on television or a streaming service, you've definitely seen their work. Uh, and with that, I want to get their opinions on, you know, artificial intelligence and the animation and the animation animation industry. Yeah, tongue twister there. <laughs> Uh, I was curious to know how they view AI, the potential impact it might have on the industry, and any concerns they might have with regarding its integration into maybe their pipeline one day. So, let me introduce these esteemed guests. From Pip Animation. Oh, no, that's the wrong person. Don't worry about that. <laughs> Leaping over the competition is CCO Corey Morrison from Big Jump Animation. And then, second, we have... Revered as the Disney of the North from Nor from Mercury Filmworks, we have Rob Buchanan, technical director. Hey, Rob. Hello. Hi, guys. All right. So the first question I generally ask people, and we'll start with Corey, is what is your definition of artificial intelligence? Um, it's a tool that is not necessarily completely usable yet. <laughs> so I just, as far as I, you know, it's, it's it's a great uh, Steven Spielberg movie. Um, it's not, you know, it's. I think it's 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 a topic that is in the ether right now for for good reason, right? It's creating a lot of uh, stress in the industry, with particularly because the industry is the way it is right now, uh, being with uh, you know very little work in North America with the due to the strikes in the in the U.S. Um, so you have this, uh, this scenario, this, it's just almost like a, a powder keg scenario where people are seeing all this, this AI technology coming out into the universe and people are starting to panic. It's like, oh my God, there's, there's technology that is creating backgrounds. What am I going to do if I'm a background artist? There's, there's technology creating and rigging characters. What am I going to do if, uh, if, if these, these options take over at studios? Uh, the, the good news is, is that they're not even remotely close to being where they need to be to be usable in a studio environment. Not even as far as I can see, I could be completely wrong, but I just, as far as a production ready option for, for, for a pipeline, it's just simply not there. Um, so, but again, I understand the concern and it's early and there's, you know, what it's going to be five years from now, who knows? Um, but until it's in a state where it's even remotely usable in a, in a production pipeline that, um, and, and I don't even think it's going to touch 2D so much, maybe 3D uh, is probably a little bit more of an issue. Um, it's it's going to take some time. And, you know, and I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of legalities that are going to be discussed over the next year to five years with uh, with the courts and with legislation and so on and so forth. It's very, very tricky right now. A lot of lawsuits, a lot of lawsuits going on. There are, yes. <laughs> yes, there are. Uh, what about you, Rob? Uh, do you have a different definition or is it more or less the same? No, it's very similar to Corey's. I mean, I see, we, I, one, there's no intelligence happening whatsoever. It's an algorithmic solution. It's math, right? So all the tools are based on math. So even like the image generators are just smashing huge data sets of it pictures together and then you're getting a result that you fool yourself in thinking it's good right i show when an artist artist uses it they go well it's a mood board at best it's not never final you always have to polish it and so your point why am i even doing this thing I, i'm stealing it from myself right you're not building your own skills you're just looking at someone other's photo bash pictures and you can do that now with photoshop you can just smash a bunch of pictures together and you're going to get a result it's um it's like using a base mesh and building on top of it right um, tools that I think are, well, we already have some now, like we talked about earlier, uh, the, there's tools in Photoshop that autocorrect color. That's useful, right? It's doing machine assisted math there to solve you doing the grunt work. 
But like Corey was saying, nothing original is being made by any of these things. It's just um, like nothing new in the so-called AI space. I've, have I seen in the 2D stylized workflow is meaningful for a studio right now? Everything's on the periphery. Like there's the uh, AI upscalers, right? Those are a good tool. Like you have a, you render out at 2K and you can upscale to 4K without having to, tend to spend the time to render at 4K. That's passable most of the time, but you still get banding if the, if the subject matter is not, you know, conducive to be AI <laughs> upscaled, right? So again, it's almost there, but not there even on that rudimentary level. But in creative stuff, like acting emotion, you okay. can't do any of that. It's not consistent and it doesn't take notes. Like, it, like I had, we had fun when we were testing at the studio was when you just ask, uh, show me a picture of a sad lady who's tired and feeling run down and old. And it just generates <laughs> old people. Right? That's not what I want. I want someone yeah. that feels like they're old, yeah, but yeah. they're not old. You know what I mean? Like it does, it's all mm -hmm. black and white yeah. instruction to it. No. There's no gray. So yeah, it's, it's not ready for prime time. But back to like 3D where it exists now, if they can mm -hmm. photograph it, they can quickly extrapolate other angles from it because it has a larger data set to pull from, right? Of real world okay. things. Um, and you're seeing that show up in the in tools now, like Blender has a integration for textures. It'll extrapolate like tree bark based on a huge library of photograph tree bark, right? Like it's, it's safe okay. in that space. But you say, hey, I want to see a tree uh, that might be on Alpha Centauri's one of its moons, and it's low G. No, not gonna make you anything, right? There's no idea. Hmm. So, well, now that we have our third guest arriving, we now have Dave Fortier. Where is he? Come on, pop hey. up. There he is. Good to see you, Dave. He's popping up. There he is. There we okay. go. There's Dave Fortier from Pip Animation. Hey, Dave. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no worries. Thank you. <laughs> logged in at five two. <laughs> it said no one has joined the meeting yet. Just please wait. And then you sent me a text like, or an email. I can uh, still okay. hear you guys as long as you can hear me. That's good. Yeah. Yep. No problem. No problem. Perfect. All right. So my question to the group is: Have you guys had discussions in your studios about the subject of AI, and what does that mean for not only your industry but your businesses? Uh, let's start with uh, Rob. Yeah, we had that discussion and right now it's contractually, we're not allowed to use any generative AI with any of our clients. It's right in the contract. Okay. So zero. And that includes, as of today, generative fill out of Photoshop. Oh, interesting. So no scene extensions. And the reason for that is no one knows how it's doing what it's doing and where that data is going. Even though we track the internet traffic of Photoshop, mm -hmm. like in and out of the studio, mm -hmm. like what's it basing that on? Is it safe? Can we be like held accountable to that okay no one wants to be seen first. Yeah. yeah yeah that makes sense <laughs> so we 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 uh banned it so yeah no no gender okay. uh what about you Corey? uh we have the discussion all the time like it's not it, it's not something we're ignoring by any way mm -hmm. shape or form so of course we're going to go up we're going to do our research we're going to find all the tools that exist out there we're going to try them out we're going to look at them you have to when you when you have a business you have to make sure that you're staying ahead of the curve you got to make sure that you're being relevant and you have to know what is coming down the pipe that could affect your bottom line and affect your crew and affect your business um this is a you know ai could ultimately be a game changer down the road um in a way that i don't think is gonna uh change anything creatively so to speak mm -hmm. like at least i hope not because at the end of the day like what we do for a living is entertainment and it's got to be entertaining. It's right. got to be created by people that have mm. to have emotion. Mm. And I just don't see AI delivering that anytime soon. So you know, it's, it's absolutely important to be aware of what is happening out there. Right. 100%. Okay. Uh, what about you, Dave? Have uh, you guys discussed it? Pip? Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Most of the discussion is happening with the floor, of course, where uh, people are worried about their employment, how things are going to change. Uh, we all understand that the end buyer wants the best product for the cheapest, but um, that that's, you know, it, it's a negotiation point. So um, when we're speaking about things, we're trying to figure out where could it apply and in, 
with some of the things um, like the software, Adobe now already incorporates that into Photoshop. Um, there's a certain amount of AI in Harmony. So uh, we want to make sure it's supporting the artists, not replacing the artists. That's the main okay. thing. Okay. That makes sense. Perfect. So then from what you guys seen of AI that's been out there, is everything you've seen either interesting or is it just overblown to what people are like, you know, the panic that's setting in like, oh, it's going to replace jobs. Or is it just from what it is right now, it's way too rudimentary. What do you guys think? Um, I, I, th I just think it's too early. It's just okay. too early. It is. I, it's, it's great for, uh, you know, TikTok videos and uh, maybe some YouTube uh, videos, but um, you know, and I keep saying it's not, it's not production ready in any way, shape or form. So I don't know, like there's, is there an echo? Is there an echo with me? I don't know. No, don't worry about it. Okay. Yeah, I guess I just, yeah. <laughs> I keep hearing myself twice. <laughs> um, I think it's just, uh, I think it's something we all need to keep an eye on for sure and mm -hmm. sort of test the waters with, uh, with regards to like how it's going to affect a pipeline. Um, I think I, with the 2D side of things, it's, it's a long way away unless it's somehow going to incorporate into Toon Boom somehow. I just, I can't even imagine that, um, you know, tweening in a, in a, in a more energetic way as opposed to a normal way. I just, I don't really know yet. Um, mm -hmm. 3D for sure. I could see it affecting that a little bit more. There's mm -hmm. tons of tools out there right now, which will just makes things easier to do building rigs, um, all the technical stuff like, uh, texturing things um all that jazz it's just it's uh if i'm all for making people's lives easier within a particular department 100 percent. i have no issues with that um but i do i do take issue when you start eliminating um, jobs and people's livelihoods but it's 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 part of every industry. Look at how this industry has evolved over the years, right? When we got into the business initially, there were there were hundreds of people making a animated feature or series. You had your 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 ink and painters, whole teams of them gone, right? You had uh, you had uh, cleanup artists gone. You have you know you had in betweeners gone. As, as soon as the digital side, as soon as Flash came out. And and to move all that stuff disappeared, and then you started. You had a team of like forty animators in a room, creating fifty-two eleven-minute episodes. Right, it's unheard of. So, yes, it, teams do shrink over time, but I like to think of think of it this way: where if if a department shrinks, you're just paying the people in that department that are there more because you're not you don't have as many people to in those positions. So it's it's a catch twenty two, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, does anyone else have an opinion on this matter? Or yeah, I would have the exact same. I actually have the exact same note about hundreds of people going down to forty. Uh, I guess what, like, I mean, AI has been around for twenty five, thirty years, right? Wet has been using it. So when you mm -hmm. have films like Lord of the Rings and the Golden Compass and those kinds of things where you need thousands of characters, that's great. You know, it, it works really, really well. You can have them affected by gravity and terrain. And if they're wet or if they're moving through water, um, you know, back in the Star Wars days where they had their 40 stormtroopers and then they reshot it with the same 40 stormtroopers in slightly different outfits and they matte painted it and they matted it and all that kind of stuff. Now you don't need to do any of the matting and you get 100% crisp work, so it's beautiful. Uh, but with the, um, with the AI uh, for 2D, it, it's one of those things like, it's almost like desktop publishing. I remember when I was in art school and thinking, oh, maybe I should go into publishing and illustration and whatever, and then desktop publishing came out and you wouldn't need publishers anymore because everybody mm. was going to self-publish. Well, not everybody's a publisher. And, and, and just like with AI, I watched this ad where they say um, it, it takes control. 
it takes control away from the creators and gives it to everyone. Well, mm. yeah. what does that mean? <laughs> yeah. Without the understanding of an end game, a starting point, and how you're going to go through those steps, AI is uh, it's going to create an awful lot of mediocre like home printed business cards and that kind of stuff. Um, will it get, uh, I'm, I'm sure it'll be incorporated more like um, with the in-betweening, you know, in-betweening is kind of cool. Um, if we could have it do uh, lip sync, that, that might, that's another tedious one that could be good. Um, but you still want to have the mind where you want the person overseeing that stuff. And sure, even though the studios have, have shrunken down, um ideally the the people in control are the the masters of it they're the they're the ones who are top of the grade like the, when when it was traditional you graduated and you usually started off as a cleanup artist and then you got into in betweening and then you got into keys and like Corey said all that's gone but the people who remain are able to do all of that and have an understanding of how it all works so as long as the AI is becoming um, a tool to keep those people creative and, and maybe it allows faster turnaround so our studios with the same people can produce more in a given year, okay. But if it's going to reduce studios down to people like me in my basement, like who's going to even watch that kind of stuff? Like that? Right. You know, it's, uh, I think it's overhyped right now. It, especially in the 2D world, because it's just not not ready for it. Right. So that's what I was going to ask next. Was just is this just the flavor of the month? Because it's just like it's such a hot topic right now. Or do you see it actually impacting the animation industry in general? Well, I think yeah. Um, you see it impacting it now in the sense like it's the same stuff, but the single image generation mm -hmm. market. Like that's happening right. now. If you go on a, the people that would sell a single image um, concept art, not that there's much of that left, but any of the single image illustration work, the the race to the bottom for how much like the what's that that Kindle book market where they fire up all those books to the Kindle yeah. market. No one's paying an illustrator to do their covers yeah. anymore. They just pay their they either self generate with an AI tool and risk being sued, or they pay someone five bucks to make a piece of garbage photo yeah. bashed art right but so the market of top quality uh, like the respect from the audience to illustrations has dwindled mm -hmm. right like the general public doesn't care they go to the bookstore they'll buy a science fiction cover a book now because hearsay right? like if you go to go to chapters now you go to the science fiction section it's mostly ips from like star wars and star trek and all the known things like the independent science fiction authors unless they're a legacy person like Stephen King or someone of that nature, they don't exist. They've all been pushed off the shelves, right? Because co corporate branding have pushed the market, right? So everyone else that doesn't have any money, like back to David was saying, is self-publishing or like they don't have much money. So they're going with what's cheap, right? They're not asking their friend to do a book cover like they used to back in the, the days, you know, they just, they're going for the cheap. Um, so like the pressure, like Corey was saying, the, the market and is always looked more racing, increasing profits, let's call it that way. Everyone wants more profits at the top mm -hmm. end. So any tool that they think will save them money and make them more money, they're going to chase. So is it flavor of the month? Sure, in the marketing side of things right now, because we're saying it's not going to do the job, but those companies want it to work. Like they really mm -hmm. do. Yeah. <laughs> so they can lower their costs and make more money. Right. And then there's that huge fantasy, like Dave's saying, there's what I saw an ad recently where it says, the the streaming service of the future will make a show aimed at the person watching it so it's the show that they like to show so it's even more of an echo chamber than ever before <laughs> so it's like the endless star wars episode of stormtrooper battles it's like who's gonna watch that there's no end to it it's, it's like a bad video old generation of narcissists right, right there yeah. like, i just it's, want it. i want stuff just about me yeah, <laughs> yeah. Benef and you can see that now the and, yeah. so is it a risk of you should be aware like when i said our studio doesn't use jit or we don't use it but we're tracking it and we're monitoring it and there'll be tools that come that make things better and you see it in the cg space a lot like world machine generates um trains that then you can go in and model and guide and stylize and things like that but you can have a base map template put down fast you can we have tools that generate trees like there's a whole engine on uh, what's it called the uh, not tree form there's a, a 
in this case, my name right now, but it makes trees and you can randomly generate an oak tree to fill the forest. So I don't have to manually model, a, you know, thousand oak trees to put in the forest. Like we're going to use tools like that right. if we can. But 2D is stylized. That's the whole point of 2D is to stylize it and guide an emotional response to the audience. So AI is not doing that because you're not in control. Mm -hmm. And that's it. There's no control in it. Like that typing a prompt, even the world's greatest authors cannot write something that captures what a picture can show given in the hands of a, of a true artist. I don't know. You give, uh, you give, uh, uh, you give Tolkien a description of blade of grass and that thing goes on for like three pages. <laughs> it's true. But can you imagine giving that to AI and what wonky thing you're going to get oh, out yeah. of that? Oh. Like a... Rainbow. <laughs> it's like, so. yeah, okay. it, like, back to the back to yeah. Tolkien though. If you go back and look at Tolkien's original illustrations, yeah. and then you look at how they're marketed now, and then after the movies came out, what these book covers yeah. look like now, it went from true fantasy, very unique and original styles based on like Northern European yeah. folklore, to orcs from World of Warcraft. Like that's where we ended up. Oh, right? Sure, you can see that in Dungeons and Dragons it's now too. Very generic. In Dungeons and Dragons, it, it's beard yeah. the same way. It went from like very fantasy, and now it's very like. Okay, it's very generic. generic. It's yeah. all the same. Yeah. And, like, yeah. and that's, as as all of us here make co original content for purpose, we don't want to be generic ever. <laughs> it's the last that we want yeah. to be. There's, there's, the so. There is a sense of it all looking the same, right? Because it is. It's, it's, it's a jumble of everybody else's stuff, all in, mashed into an image. You know, if you... Uh, if you uh, if you're a Dungeons and Dragons player and you want to you know get an image of what a fighter might look like, you'll get fifteen thousand different Im images of what a fighter looks like, but they all look the same. They just all look the same. Different armor, maybe a different face and a slightly different background, but the painting style, the style overall in general, just looks very similar. Yeah. Um, but again, it's it's here. It's not going to go away anytime soon. Um, so. You know, I, you know, I encourage people to research it, look at it, use it, see what it does. So you know what you're getting into, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's just, there's so much stuff out there and more and more of it is going to be uh, coming out. And I think it's important that if you're an artist in this, in this industry in animation or illustration or, um, or you're just, you know, you're, you do it for fun. Um, or a filmmaker, knowing what exists out there and how to potentially utilize it, uh, you know, in some of your work. Um, if it helps make things, if you're just a, a kid at home and you're making films and, and ideas, it's a great learning tool to learn how to do things and create content and what have you. Fine, no, no problem. But um, if you're going to start making, I guess, money off of it, uh, you, you, you might want to think twice about it. At least for now, <laughs> until yeah. until legalities uh, are sort of dealt with, which uh, and these companies they pour a lot of money into legislation to change legislation, so yeah. it's it's not going to go away uh, easily. So yeah, right. that's one area I think AI can be used. Like when when we write a script, it has to go through a clearance to make sure there's no copyright infringement trade. Uh, tra trademark mm -hmm. infringements, those kinds of things. So the fact that metadata can be added to everything when a film comes out, broadcaster X might use AI to run it through and it says, oh, wait a second, part of this was created by Alex Moran. Were you paid for this? Oh, yes, he was. Okay. Well, what about Rob? No, nope, no, nope, Rob wasn't paid. So we can't accept this until all of this stuff gets, gets done because uh, the the AI is incorporating material that wasn't released. That could be a, a good place to use it. But well, I, with, I wonder. I wonder if there's going to be something out there where you can actually tag your artwork, right? In a way that, um, you know, it would it would. You could do that. You would run it yeah. through some sort of scanner. I know that sounds. No, they're, they're looking at yeah. that now, right? Under the UK or the EU AI legislation is that all AI artwork has to be. But then, yeah. then you get into that whole concept of uh, licensing fees, you know, licensing mm -hmm. packaging and licensing your work 
Well, then it makes sense because you just you keep making packages of work and you keep selling your those licenses to all the uh, uh, the AI generating world out there. And it's like it's like anything. If you're a popular artist, you're at the top of the heap and you're getting all the residuals. If you're just working your way at the bottom, you gotta you gotta climb the ladder, yeah. right? So. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a way to tag it. It'll be like the original Blade Runner, right? He, he finds a, a scale and he brings it to the lady and she goes, oh, that's a snake scale. And she finds the code. Like, like every, <laughs> pretty much Adam number. Has, has a code on it. It must yeah. be much easier to do that digitally. And with that kind of thing, like you have, uh, I meant to look up his name. There's a, uh, there's a musician who started to play a bunch of riffs, did them on his guitar, sent out a CD, like, you guys can use these riffs, just buy the CD, it's $2. The guy's a multimillionaire now, because he's made so many different riffs, and a yeah. lot of, um, um, when you have uh, corporations building the music, and then having a singer come in and sing those parts, a lot of times you hear these beats and the, you know, the horns are this way and the strings are that way. And, and it's the same guy playing an awful lot of that. And he's licensing it to absolutely everybody. We might've even used some of the stuff in, in some of the work that we've done and he, he's properly licensed it and that's all fine. And, and that's great if you can do that with AI, but currently it's just sort of whatever they feed into it and what they've been feeding into it isn't necessarily public domain. I mean, I we I could totally see Disney loving this because they have such a massive archive. They're their own broadcaster. They're their own producer. They have their own studios. Oh, but they won't need them anymore. So because they can just run it through the machine. But for everybody else, we still have the gatekeepers who are the Netflix and the CBCs and Comedy Network that we need to cater to what they think they want. Like they always say, this is what our viewership wants. I don't know how much of that's true or if they're lagging behind a little bit, but those restraints help you focus and define and find a unique way of telling that story where if everyone in the studio is just putting in whatever, I'm just going to plug this stuff in and I'll let AI figure it out. It, everything becomes very vanilla along the way and people get lazy you know we get a world full of wally -E instead of uh creative people yeah but yeah just just to piggyback on that like the, the the issue is like sure yeah the gatekeepers you have your netflix you have your uh you have amazon you have you know cbc you have tv on camera they want good content they want curated well thought out content if it's educational well you need a you need you need uh, educational consultants to back the the series. There's a ton of experts that on top because you're dealing with kids, right? You're you're making content for children, so you have to make sure that you you dot your eyes and you cross your t's. You have to make sure that the content works. It can't you can't have any hidden little things in there in the background. Who knows what's being uh, like could be generated out of uh, out of some of these images it's it's so silly so that that there that alone there is is the prime primary reason why um we're going to continue doing the stuff that we're doing right now you know like you know, hilda would never be hilda if you if you didn't have a, a hundred two hundred people like blood sweat and tears over top of that to turn it into what it is you know you can't the little the creator who created the original comics. Right? You can't you can't generate that from a prompt, right? So and and that that goes for like any content that's being created right now that is is going to be viewed on an, an actual network. It you have to the, what we do is we create stories and we tell great stories to uh, kids and families all across the world, all across North America. They're not going to watch it. They're not stupid. People are not dumb. If a show sucks, they won't watch it. If it's not funny, they won't watch it. If it's not entertaining, they won't. If it's all flash in the pan, it's it's awful. That's why Netflix, the Netflixes, and all these other 
broadcasters got into trouble because they were producing so much content, right? It, it lacked story. It lacked the substance. And so people just said, okay, enough's enough. And so it's, you know, started getting rid of subscriptions. So now everyone's really starting to look towards curating and creating content that means something that's going to pull the audiences in because, you know what, I want to get that subscription because uh, I want to watch that series, right? I can't wait. That's what's happening. As everyone in the industry, we're all professionals. We've gone to school. This is a trade. We've honed our abilities and this is what we do. You know, there's the there's the uh, weekend warriors like myself who might do a little bit of plumbing or might work on a deck, but I'm not building a house. Well, when we're <laughs> building these shows, like these are cathedrals. These are works mm -hmm. of art that, that, that have gone from concept from one artist all the way through to the final audio mix that's gone through another artist. And it's gone through dozens and dozens of professionals that make it better, hopefully, at every step of the way. And then again, you have the broadcasters who sit there and go, this is good, but we want this tweaked and this changed, and we need to do a few little things here. And it gets polished to perfection. And if everybody's doing that in their basement, again, maybe their grandmother will love the work that they're coming up with, but it's- It's it a team effort, Dave. Yeah. yeah, it's a team effort. Like this, the only one, there's only the major streamer that is essentially based on letting the masses curate it is YouTube, right? Remember all the YouTube had, and they paid for cartoons at one point. Yep. Do you remember it that? It didn't last long. They were, <laughs> no. No, because it got buried under the noise, yeah. right? It wasn't good enough because they didn't promote it. They just let the masses dictate what rises to the top. And if you just look at the YouTube homepage, what's up the front? It's just, you know, what 12-year-olds are watching mm -hmm. on mass. It's just junk, yeah. right? And it's 30-second spots. And the TikTok took that even shorter, right? It's what, seven seconds? Like, whatever the slot is. <laughs> There's no, nothing will make you go back and watch more of it, right? So, so I guess I'm just curious then, play devil's advocate. Is there a purpose for AI in the animation pipeline? Or is it just you know, too rudimentary. You know, I, I think, you know, you, you could potentially use it to, as an idea generator, something to, mm -hmm. to get the, uh, the, the creative juices flowing, but, you know, a starting point, you know, um, as I was saying earlier, it's like, I, you know, I, I need, I need to, uh, 15 different tugboats and, and here you have 15 different tugboats and now you can take bits and pieces of each tugboat and create something that you, is really unique and, and wonderful, you know, but an artist is doing that. But you say, I like this tugboat, this tugboat, this tugboat, right? Go to town and make a great, make a great tugboat, right? I like these elements. No different than, you know, scouring the internet to find images that you liked, you know, for some early development projects or, um, I'm creating a show that's Indiana Jones and Star Wars all together, right? Uh, you're, you're using references and material in order to get the idea across to the people that are going to buy your product, right? But then when you get into production, well, then now you got to, now you, you, you hire a team that's going to make real original work, something that's going to be unique and interesting. That concept through one individual yeah. or two individuals to refine the idea. Yeah. I also see it used for blocking but, and storyboards, yeah. but not for storyboarding per se, even though I know, Alex, you've had a guest who, who yes. wrote some <laughs> material for storyboarding. But to do a yeah, quick blog up and, you know, go in there and tweak things, it's almost the equivalent of thumb, thumbnailing a storyboard so that all the artists have a, a common foundation between, like, all the boards could be thumbnailed out with the director and the board supervisor so that they're all starting with some solid ground but I, I honestly i only see it in places like that or like lip sync like i'd said before like well i think the place you'll see when you see it now is in the in the industrial process of the animation pipeline like i said the ai upscalers mm -hmm. if i can save time rendering to a 4k show by rendering 2k and upscaling it to 4k mm -hmm. I'm not sure because that's not taking anyone's job away. it's a grunt job that no one wants to do it's actually just machine work anyway mm -hmm. i could run the render farm for a week or I could run it for half, one week at 2K and upscale it. You know what I mean? Like that's going to happen. Color correction, right? We all use AI color correction now because it's amazing. Like um, we use uh, the that's the tool that I used in the editing suite the other day where it balances all the audio channels. Brings oh. them all when you do like 
crowd record and it brings all the into the same range like those tools are here to stay and they're amazing right because it makes our lives mm -hmm. easier i think those tools will stick around because artists will like you know what that tool is awesome it allows me to get to what i want to do faster because yeah. um, it's not replacing it's enhancing my workflow right or it's taking away a redundant task that no one wants to do in the first place like the like Corey was saying i think in, in harmony they have tweening right and it's it's linear based you can't put a curve in it like you have to help it by a breakdown drawing but if you can make that tweening process more interactive and it makes better tweens that for aiming at your favors, you know, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Like people would like that. Well, I, I, think any, I don't think any animator would appreciate getting the meat and potatoes of the scene pulled together quickly so you can focus on the nuance, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. The that's, and, and I think that's any production process and that's across every department. If I can, if as a BG painter, if I could just get something to lay down the, the base real quick for me, so then I can spend the time on the rendering and the detail, right? And how this works with the next one. I mean, you know, yeah, maybe, you know, like that's where I'd say it, uh, it would help wherever it wouldn't, it would, it's not getting rid of any, any specific department or getting rid of any specific job. It's just making it easier so you can get through more of it, right? Yeah, you get to the end result quicker. Yeah. Yeah. So then as we wrap things up, uh, what bit of advice would you impart on artists who are concerned about AI and animation that are in the industry right now? Like what, what advice would you give to each um, member in your studios who are concerned about it? I'll start with uh, Corey. Research it, understand it. You need to understand what it is, period. You gotta know what it is. You can't just, you can't put blinders on and pretend it doesn't exist or that it's not there. Um, learn it and understand. You should know how to prompt. You should know how to prompt. It's, that's one of the tools that's gonna be uh, everywhere. It's already here, right? You gotta know how to do it properly, right? There's all, there's tons of different specific prompts that get you specific outputs, right? Mm -hmm. um, understanding the tools. When you go into Photoshop now, there's so many AI tools now. If you go into um, um, uh, Microsoft 365, they have Copilot. You know, it, you can you can get the gist of a document in two seconds. <laughs> you know, these are tools that will save a tremendous amount of time. In, in, in the grand scheme of things, believe me, when you're when you're multitasking and you're doing a hundred different things every day, um, if you can get a leg up anywhere on some of those tasks, uh, I do it. Right? It just it just it saves some time instead of perusing through everything uh, like a, with a fine tooth comb. There's so much to do on a day to day basis. So um, I think it's very important to understand the tools that exist out there and uh, you know, try them out um, and see what they do. And more importantly, focus on just being a really great filmmaker or content creator or artist. At the end of the day, what we do is a craft and it's the 10,000 hour rule. It takes a long time to be good at it. Uh, what about you, Dave? What, would you, what advice would you give to artists who are worried about AI uh, in, at PIP? very similar. I mean, it's like, it, it's just another tool. It's a very powerful tool. So, you know, before paint brushes, they were using sticks to, to move the mud around to paint things. Uh, you know, we got digital, I, I painted backgrounds for years using a mouse and killed my elbow. And then all of a sudden the tablet came out and I thought, this is so bizarre. I could <laughs> never go back to a mouse. The tablet is amazing. <laughs> we have, you know, working with, um, uh, Storyboard Pro and uh, Harmony and even things like Flash, Adobe Photoshop. Um, you know, having having been a painter originally on canvas, you know, the undo buttons and all those things are amazing. Plus, you have layers now that you can play with. Know the software, uh, understand what it can do for you. Also, know its limitations. So, like one of the fears with AI, like with Real Engine, might be um, where um, the uh, executive producers or the broadcasters are saying, so, well, why not just apply that to it? Not understanding how it even plugs into the equation. So mm -hmm. the more people understand those, these tools, 
the better they can hone their skills. It, it, like, it, it comes down to that individual filtering what they want to do through that medium. So if it's a keyboard or a mouse or a tablet or a, an actual paintbrush, um, AI is one of those tools where, again, it's already been in all of our lives, right? From farming through to anything. Um, learn how it applies to your craft and be very good at it. When I speak with the students, I always say, be the number one graduate. And there's always a couple who say, like, how can we all do that? That's up to you. <laughs> be the <laughs> best that you can be. Aim for the top. Maybe you won't be, but at least you're shooting for it. So I think the same is with AI and, and also find out where it can be a benefit in your process. Like if you're whatever, if you're, if you're a layout artist, how can it benefit your craft so that you're the person who's more hireable. Okay. Uh, what about you, Rob? What advice would you give? Well, above like feed and everybody else, but I'll add one other comment. Like I agree with Corey and Dave, like you have to understand how the tools work, what they do, what mm -hmm. they can't do. But you also have to realize we're in, a, we're in the industrial age, right? We're in the industrial age and everything is aimed at if we can automate it, mm -hmm. we will. So look at what you're doing today. See where you can add value to anything that you're doing that a machine cannot do by automation and that's where you double down on it right so emotional context mm -hmm. right there's story points and beats if it's just movement from a to b yeah we're going to automate right. that right you can do that mm -hmm. now but we can make automation better so it goes faster if if you're painting repet if you're like back to the hand painted pipeline so you're doing digital workflow that's the paperless workflow where you're still drawing keyframes and that's awesome because you want very dynamic acting that rigs can't get too easily but if you can use a tool that will paint frame A, then match the colors all the way to frame 100, yeah, you're going to use that tool because who wants to bucket fill all 100 frames? It's just not going to happen, right? That's going to be automated. So if that's what you're doing today is bucket filling, you know that it's going to go to automation at some point in the near future, if not like next week. <laughs> so add value to that. Like double down on your fundamental skill as a craftsperson mm -hmm. and then do that. Perfect. Thanks, guys. This was an awesome talk. I love it. Thank you. Thank, thank you, guys. All right, yeah. here we go. Another one in the books. I want to thank our guests for contributing on the subject of AI and animation, and hopefully you get something out of it. Here's hoping the more conversations we have, the more cl clearer the future will become. And hopefully, the more we talk, the less we demystify AI and show the realities of it. But again, no one has a, no one has a crystal ball, so that can all change in a matter of seconds. But all we can do is hopefully shape the future that we want. Check in for our next episode. Until then, let's keep the conversation going. See you next time. Goodbye.